William, are you buzzing? I'm celebrating National Pollinators Week. <laughs> we'll fill you in on all the buzz next on Garden Time. <laughs> buzz, buzz. <laughs> Welcome to Garden Time and happy Father's Day and happy National Pollinators Week. You know, we're out here at Garland Nursery and what a great time of the year to take Dad to a garden center, find some wonderful plants that assist in pollination, especially helping with even our native pollinators. You know, they have a really wide selection, but we picked out just a few. So this is Agastache, and so there's this beautiful little shorter selection and then this nice tall one. And don't forget, herbs are great pollinator plants too, like rosemary and sage and thyme. And remember the Asclepias tuberosa, which helps in so many areas of pollination. Coming up in the show today, we'll be talking about utility trees. Now these are the trees that fit really well under power lines in your front yard. We'll also be showing you the best roses to put in containers. But first, some tips on in-ground irrigation. It wasn't that long ago when we were out here at Wright Irrigation and I was talking to Cindy about drip systems. However, Cindy, you guys also really are involved in the in the underground real sprinkler type systems as well, aren't you? Yes. That's... So you've got you've got some information to give us and a, sure. and a whipping rod that you've got there also too. So That's tell right. us what we're going to be talking about. Well, we're going to talk about the basics of a residential irrigation system. Because it is, there's a lot to it, so we're not going right. to cover all of it. They'll come right. to you later for more information on that, but give us those basics. So I've got a diagram up above your head here uh -huh. that kind of shows uh, the anatomy of a sprinkler system. Yeah. So I'll start here. This would be your water line to your house. Uh -huh. So you tap off of the water line to your house and go to a main stop. This is going to be what you use to isolate it for the winter, for um, to, uh, to winterize it or to do repairs sure. or anytime you want to shut it off. Then the next thing is a backflow. This particular one is a double check. There are other kinds we can talk about later. Um, and then this is a drain. Another so, thing for winterization. Another thing, because okay. you want to, you want basically want to drain the main line, the sure. pressurized line for the winter. Sure, okay. So then after that, we've got the, the main line. So this is the pressurized line. And then it goes to the valves. And the valves are, they run the different zones or stations. Uh -huh. So um, each station would have um, a set of sprinklers based on how many gallons per minute you have available. Which is very important. It's the amount of gallons, not the amount of right. sprinklers. Okay. Right, okay. right. People ask me all the time how many sprinkler heads on a zone. Yeah. Well, it isn't how many heads on a zone, it's how many gallons you have to use at one time. Okay. So Cindy, after the zones, what, what else is left in the system? Well, the valves then are wired back to the controller, uh -huh. and then the controller can have a rain sensor on it to shut it off when it rains. Sure. Um, that's pretty much it. So now, Cindy, we've seen the, the, the schematic up there, mm -hmm. which is, you know shows us what, but let's just go over this stuff that's more specifically. Tell me what these are again. These are valves. So uh -huh. as you saw up above, this is a, a zone valve. Okay. This is a zone valve with a backflow preventer. Oh, okay. So we talked about um, that kind of backflow up there. This is the other kind. Mm -hmm. So you would have one of these hooked to your valve. They come, they come that way. Yeah. Um, and you'd have one for every zone. Now this type stands above the ground. Now, a backflow preventer basically just prevents water from your sprinkler system backflowing into the public water supply. There you go. That's that's pretty simplistic. And it, it it's the only code thing on, you on an irrigation have. system. Yeah. So then. Now, when, when we talked about drip systems, all of the little heads here had colors as well, but these are different, right? Right, right. <laughs> those were gallons, right? Right, right. And these are? These, these are, well, those were gallons too. Those were okay. gallons per hour because drip okay, is low yeah. pressure, low volume. All this right. is gallons per minute. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So this would be, and uh, where we were talking about all the gallons you could use at one time yeah. on your zone. This is how you calculate it. Oh, okay. So each head, one head is not equal to another. Each one basically um, is uh, uses a different amount of water based on how far the head throws and what pattern it throws. So if it's a circle or if it's a like a half circle, all right. of that stuff. Okay, right. and then the the width that the water goes or the leaf. distance. Okay, from the head out. Okay. So um, for instance, 
This, this is just a plain spray body. And the, uh, there's two kinds of, of sprinkler heads. There's spray heads, which do a fan that just waters the entire area the entire time. And then there are rotors. These are just large and small rotors. But they're a single stream that moves back and forth. So Cindy, you have five design tips that are kind of the rules that you live by. What are those? Well, the first would be um, calculate your gallons, like we talked about. Um, if you don't know how many gallons per minute you have to use, then you don't, you can't really design efficiently. Yeah. You, you may be using too many, too many heads on a zone, which is the worst, or you're not getting as much out of your zones as you could be getting. Okay. Um, you should be using uh, number two would be use on a residential system. The the best idea is just use one inch pipe throughout the whole project. Um, if you've got you know acreage or something bigger, then you might use different pipe. But for just a residential, you know, system, that that would be the best choice. Head-to-head um, -head coverage. No. So explain that to me. That means um, because heads don't water right around the base of themselves. Sure. They throw away from themselves. Yeah. They need the other heads to water their own feet. Oh, okay. So if you've got if you've got heads that are spaced and, and they're watering like this then you're missing the most important part. You want, you want complete 100% coverage. You need two heads watering every square foot. So your minimum. elbows would be the sprinklers. Would be the sprinklers, and, and basically they're, you're, okay. you're watering all the way. Because if you're doing this, you're missing the most important yeah, that part. that makes sense. You know. Okay. Um, you know, don't mix heads. So we talked about the fact that there are spray heads and rotors. Right. S because they water differently, different minutes, you don't want to put them both on the same zone. So you'd have all spray heads on one zone, all rotors on another zone. That's the reason for the zones. Right, okay. because basically because uh, spray heads are going to run 8 to 10 minutes. Sure. And rotors are going to run 20 to 30. Whole different ball game. So how yeah. do you set your controller if you got both on the same, okay. same zone? Um, then, you know, number five would be the swing joint. Yeah, and you... I find that fascinating. Tell me about that. So the swing joint, this has been around for a long time. You know, contractors always use swing joints. Basically, it makes it easiest to set your heads. Wow. So you're just, you know, manufacturing with, some, with a couple of fittings and a, and a piece of pipe that you can cut to length. So it can be longer or shorter. Um, this way you can adjust the height of the head. So, or if you add bark dust, you can raise it up. You know? So then, normally, this would have been just the rigid PVC. Would have been just oh, a straight okay. piece. Oh, that's much more smart. <laughs> that's smart right. to do. And, and the other, the other thing is, is if it, when you're when you're trenching in your pipe, you don't necessarily want to put the head right where the pipe is. Right. You know, otherwise you're zigging and zagging all over the place. Yeah. So you can put a head here and then put one here as you run through. You know, run that's run down funny. your line. Um, and again, set in the height. You know, the head could be in line with the pipe if it needs to be. But it doesn't have to be. Yeah. When the head, when your bushes grow and you need to move it out a few inches, you can just add more funny pipe. This is called funny pipe. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is called funny pipe or swing pipe. Well, the name made me laugh. So <laughs> yeah, I you know I say it all the time. I can do it with a straight face. But um, yeah, so swing pipe or funny pipe, and you can make this as long as you want. So you could add and and move the head out so that it's not been, being blocked by the bushes or what have you. Um, so yeah. <laughs> It, easy, you know, even if you, you, you run over it with a heavy tractor or even, even a, you know, if the set ground is soft enough, even your car, and it just squishes it down, you dig around and just pull it back up again. Otherwise, you're snapping off your fittings. Yeah. So now, Cindy, a lot of people have already have plans, but they're really lost and confused. You are sure. more than willing to look these over and help them, oh, aren't you? Oh, yes. We, I can offer, um, you know, review of your plans that you've done or you've had someone do um, just to make sure it's going to do what you think it's sure. going to do. I don't charge for that. Um, I, we can answer all the questions you like. Um, we do have a design service if you wanted us to do a design for you. Uh -huh. uh, we charge $100 for the design package. And then if you buy at least 75% of the product with us, we rebate you back $80. Oh, wow. So That's it's just perfect. a $20 final fee. That come with a, a layout of, of the design, a parts list, and an installation manual. Wonderful. So basically a custom kit. Well, you know, I'll tell you, I spring, the, the whole thing kind of scares me. So I love that I've known Cindy. I can come and get all the help I need to make the sprinkler system just right for my own garden. Now you can do the same. You can go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website. Cindy, thank you so much. Thank you.
stages, 22 shows, one sweet weekend. The 24th Annual Oregon Jamboree, presented by South Pacific Auto Sales, is bringing you the biggest show of 2016. Carrie Underwood. Toby Keith. Let's have a party. Randy Hauser. Come on now. Chase Bryant, and so many more. July 29th through the 31st. Tickets on sale now at OregonJamboree.com. Presented by South Pacific Auto Sales. William, it's a time for the Oregon Jamboree. Yeah, I could tell that from the cowboy hat. <laughs> you think? <laughs> it is time for the Oregon Jamboree happening in Sweet Home, Oregon at the end of July. And we have tickets to give away. And it's really easy. All you have to do is go to GardenTime.tv, send us an email on why you like Garden Time television or why you like Garden Time magazine or both. And we'll pick the winners from those entries at the end of June. <laughs> Good luck, everyone, and yeehaw! DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. In the summer months, water use can double or triple due to outdoor watering. Here are three simple tips to help save water and money this summer. Set your sprinklers so that they're watering your lawn and plants and not the pavement. Water early in the morning or later in the evening when temperatures are cooler. Group plants with similar water, shade, and sun needs together. For more water conservation information and tips, check out the Regional Water Providers Consortium at www.conserveh2o.org. Well, it's a beautiful day. I'm at Heirloom Roses with Ben. And Ben, you have some tips for us about putting roses in containers, but we can do that. Sure, a lot of people think that roses have to go in the ground, but actually they'll, they'll do quite well in containers. It's just selecting the right rose and then the right container. Huh. And uh, as you can see, we're standing in front of Heirloom. It's a hybrid tea. Uh, it does pretty good on height, but it also does really well in a container. It does, and it's a pretty big rose, so you have a pretty big size pot. Yes, so we like this pot. It's about 24 inches across and about 24 inches deep. And actually, this is from Costco, so they're very cost effective and easily potted into. Uh, one of the key tricks is making sure it's got drain holes at the bottom. So the ones at Costco, we just drill a few holes in the bottom to make sure that all that extra water will drain out. Ah, really good tip. And then the same kind of soil we would use in any containers. Yes. Excellent. Well, we have some other containers and some other roses that we're going to match up to make them perform the best. Yes. Well, you have some beautiful things here. So what do we have? So we have two miniature roses, a micro mini and a miniature that we're going to put into this pot. And as you can see, it's got great drainage holes. And for a large rose, this would be much too small. Sure. But for a micro mini and a miniature, this is just a great size. And so we'll go ahead and pop this up. All right. We have the soil there. And we're, so we're just going to use, this is just some of our potting soil that we use here at the nursery. We oh, get okay. it in bulk and we're just going to load this right in. And really three plants aren't that big or overwhelming for well, this size pot? No, it, it, it will fill in and be tight, but nice. it's certainly not overwhelming. Excellent. Um, another thing I like to use um, is, is aged cow manure. And so this is well aged and pretty soft and gentle on the plants, but it adds a lot of nitrogen and good things to the soil. So we're going to use about half a bag of this in here. All right. So then you don't have to put any kind of slow release right away. Nope, you just put that in. We just get right in here with our hands and All mix right. that up. That's, we're gardeners. We'll worry about we can washing do that. Them later. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so what we're going to do is put Sweet Fairy in the front here, and this is a micro mini. Uh, it'll get about 12 inches tall at its highest. Okay. And we'll just tuck that right into the front. And it's really going to almost spill over that edge there. That's right. All right. And then I have the one that's kind of a taller one, right in the back here. Yeah. Perfect. And what I, I like about down. this is that this is kind of a, a light pink and this is a lavender and also oh. the foliage is mm -hmm. a little bit different green. Yeah. And then to really top this off, I thought we'd put a sedum in the front there. And that's cool because now we have a little bit of a blue-green texture and color and that's it just right. fits right there. That is really pretty. And really, it's all done and all there is, we're going to have blooms tomorrow. Yeah, we'll have blooms <laughs> tomorrow, all the way through October really. And the nice thing about these is this is really easy to just set inside and put up against your house and they'll go, it'll overwinter and you have, the, you have the beautiful blooms again next year. Ah, that is nice. And really takes care of something blooming all season long in the summertime. That's, because that's what we want in our containers. That's right. Another thing that's critical in containers is to water with a liquid fertilizer and not granular. 
granular, the salts will build up and okay. it gets a little toxic. All but right. a liquid fertilizer just washes on through and it's really gentle on the roots. And it's enough to keep them blooming the whole season? Yes, perfect. About every three weeks we say a, a liquid fertilizer. Ah, and then what about this one over to your right? Yeah, so this is a little bit bigger of a container and uh, we have a rose here called Baby Love. And we won't pop this up today, but oh, this rose okay. will do about three feet in height. And so as you can imagine, I would put just this rose of yellow and really complement the other pots quite well. And I love that you have a kind of contrast between that cobalt blue and the yellow that yeah. really really makes that pop. Yeah. Well, the fun thing about containers is you can really pick your rows, pick your container and really make it work for you in the colors you love. And so that being said, we always say pick your rows before you pick your container. Ah, good uh, idea. Fall in love with a rose and then figure out what container works for it after that. All right. And then what do we have on the very end here? Well, this is exciting. We've been talking about this and you've <laughs> probably have. seen this. This is the garden thyme rose. Look at that. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, oh. and one of the things we like that it's a nice compact shrub rose. It's not going to get gigantic. It's going to be about three feet in height and it will do really well in a container. Oh, nice. So uh, a great way to keep garden time on your porch. Uh-huh. And those are available now at Heirloom? They are available right now. Come on out and get one. Ben, these other roses are pretty too. What are their names? Yeah, so this is Jump for Joy. It's Aww. a Floribunda. And again, this is a nice growth habit for a pot. It's not going to get overly big. Again, but I would put this in a larger pot, about a 24-inch pot. Okay. And then this rose here is beautiful, fragrant Doris Day. It's a wonderful yellow, and that, again, will do well in a pot. And those are just part of our large selection of shrub roses and, and, and nice growth habit roses that will do well in pots. Uh, and then what about watering? We're going to get into some heat now, and it's going to be summer. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, these pots will soak up a lot of heat, but also they'll dry out very easily, especially on a covered porch or something like that. So, you know, daily watering, make sure they're in a good watering regimen. Uh, if you have a drip system, that really is the best way to go with these. And then as you water in, again, liquid fertilizer about every three weeks. Any other tips that we could have to take away from all this? Well, one thing about the soil, it's important to note to use an organic potting soil without granular fertilizer in it. Sometimes that granular fertilizer, well, it's time release, will release right away. And it builds up kind of a toxic level of salts in the soil that's hard on new roots. And so these young roses have brand new roots and it's just too hard on them. So stay away from that. A good organic potting mix is the best. Ah, well, you heard it here. And this is the place to come for roses, for your containers or your garden. Why not bring them right up onto your deck this summer and enjoy that fragrance every day. Thanks so much, Ben. Thank you. Our northwest weather can be really harsh on our statues and pottery, so I'm at Little Baja in Burnside with Jared, and you have a product that really would help with that. Yes, we sure do. We highly recommend this sealer here. It's a masonry top seal made by Timber Pro UV. It's made locally. Now, the reason we like it so much is that it's non-toxic and water-based. So it's not going to, you know, hurt the birds or the animals. Ah, so you can put it in your bird baths, which is really important. You sure can. Yeah, because I've noticed cracks in mine, and it's like, I wish I would have done that, so I need to go home and do that this Yeah, weekend. it really helps to preserve the skin on the concrete. And the good thing about this is you can use it on brick, asphalt, pottery, statues, anything that you, that's porous that you'd like to preserve. Uh, and so how do, you, how do you apply it? Well, you want to make sure that the item's clean, okay. that you uh, got it nice and clean, make sure there's no stains on it. Because once you steal it, the stain will be trapped in there. So clean it up really good, let it dry out. And then once it's dry, you can apply your sealer. We, like, we recommend that you work from the bottom up. And uh, that way you don't get any run lines going down the concrete. And then once it's sealed, it's sealed, and that'll last for about five years. Ah, and you can put it right back outside, or should you have a drying time? Oh yeah, you want to let it dry for a good 24 hours. So Jared, I see that in your store you have a little demonstration, so can you demonstrate it for us? Oh sure, well we have two frogs here. It'll be real easy to tell which one's sealed and which one isn't. Ah. You'll see the water beads up and runs off, just like Rain-X on a windshield. And on this guy, the moisture just kind of soaks right into the concrete. So Jared, that is really telling between the two frogs with the product and without. And so how long does it last again? It will last for up to five years. You'll notice when the moisture starts soaking into the concrete, it's time to seal it. But I'd say about five years. Uh, well, you know, this is really a great little project that you could do for all of your masonry at your home, your pottery, your bird baths, and your statues. So come out to Little Baja, talk to Jared, and get this product to take home. Based on reviews, I found Capital. It was an excellent experience. I felt very comfortable, especially being a single woman. Kick off summer with a great deal from Capital. Lease the new 2016 Subaru Forester 2.5i CVT, the most award-winning small SUV, just $188 per month. Own for just $23,438. When I hear stories from other people about car buying experiences, they're horror stories. And mine, 
I just left with a big smile and I've been smiling ever since. I got it my way on the parkway. Since 1982, the wall has been making local gardens beautiful, naturally. Whether you need a new wall, concrete patio, fire pit, or driveway, the wall's expert craftsmen can build it. We back up our work with a five-year warranty so you'll know it'll last. We use the highest quality materials, including stamped colored concrete, natural stone, and we're the leader in using recycled concrete. Create an outdoor environment you'll enjoy for years with the help of your friends at The Wall. Join us for Berries, Brews, and Barbecue, now happening three weekends in June, featuring Oregon Craft Ciders and Brews and Barbecue. Enjoy barbecue. You pick strawberries, hay rides, live music, and much, much more. It's farm fun for the whole family at French Prairie Gardens. I'm at Garden Fever this morning with Lori, and Lori, you've picked out some really nice salvias. We haven't mm -hmm. talked about salvias in a long time, and really, there's such a range of colors. Oh my goodness, you <laughs> go from hot to cool, and uh, you know, something that actually is very vivid in the garden. Um, you know, the thing about salvias is kind of frustrating for some gardeners, is that they can be a little touchy mm. uh, in coming back every year. Uh, definitely, there's certain ones that you want to grow as annuals, and they're sure. fast growing, and they bloom all summer, so that's they do. that's the benefit. That sounds like an annual to me, a good <laughs> annual. So you know, you have anything from like this salvia, salvia chiapensis, Look and that's like color. a hot, hot pink. You really make a, an impact with that. Now this guy I would grow as an annual, whereas this big mama here, mm -hmm. uh, which is salvia sensation deep rose, wow, the numerosa that. species, this is actually a hardy one. One of the tips on getting them to come back is, to try not to be too tidy okay. in the spring or the fall. All right. You wait till you start to see some new growth, and then it's okay to go ahead and cut back the ah, dead. Okay. The dead. Now, if you live in a little bit colder area, like I live up in Battleground, mm -hmm. I did some pruning. I was very uh, on time uh, and with it this year, and, and I did some and tidy, <laughs> and I did some pruning uh, when we had a little bit of a warm spell, and I saw that new growth, and then we had a couple of just very light frosts. Oh. Took it down. Oh, shoot. you know. So I say wait till May if you want to be safe about right. it. Right, especially in a colder area because mm -hmm. then you're really, especially for some of these ones that are tender, the nemorosas are going to be more hardy mm -hmm. in our area in Oregon. But um, you're right, some of the tender ones. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some more of these. Yeah. So uh, this one, I've heard from William that this one, Patton's Salvia Patton's, that uh, this is called Cobalt. Look at that beautiful, color. beautiful, vivid, vivid. Uh, more of a pale blue, mm -hmm. uh, robin's egg blue, and larger leaves, mm -hmm. and that may be one of the reasons it comes back. Um, this one actually seems to be a little bit hardier. It will put on a lot of growth, just like the other guys. And then there's also, like we we're talking about, the range of color, everything wow. from all Pure these white. colors to wow. creamy colors. Creamy this white, guy yeah. is Salvia Gregii, Sally Vanilla. Oh. Uh, Sally G Vanilla. and. Um, there's a number of lighter color ones that are coming out now, so watch in the nurseries for those. Um, then also, you can go all the way down Look to red. Wow. a hot red, Very and nice. this is called Salvia Flame, obviously. And this is another one that I probably would grow as an annual. And it's nice when they come back. Sometimes a mild winter like we've had, what, not too much rain, not too much mm -hmm. cold, mm -hmm. it's a little bit easier on the plant. And mm -hmm. I think really good drainage with salvias. Definitely. And if you have a, a, a very hot south-facing mm. wall at the back of the border, you can do a taller one. Wow. And, and then, then what is this lips. one? That's hot lips. And uh, we were talking earlier about how some of these flowers have a solid red, and then the others have a little bit of the white starting to show, and that's where the the lipstick kind of right, uh, right. name comes from. And uh, we learned that it's actually uh, the, the colder weather, when it starts blooming in colder weather, it comes out solid. So after the first bloom with any of these salvias, you want to take them down oh, to okay. Trim them. the next set of leaves. And as you can see, there's another mm -hmm. guy coming right out there. There's actually buds on that. And so that second set of blooms on hot lips will be more of the lipstick on the little white face. 
So I call this the Oregon color, red. <laughs> and then <laughs> when we get a little warmer late summer, you'll get the, the actual hot lips look. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that if you come out to Garden Fever, you can see all of these wonderful salvias. They're great for the garden. They do a lot of different uh, jobs for us. They're either mm -hmm. containers or in the border. Mm -hmm. So really you have salvias for any kind of garden. Mm -hmm. Very adaptable. Well, thank, thank you, you so much for all the information. Yeah, thank you. Nice to be here. <laughs>Welcome to Blooming Junction, where it's easy to connect with nature. At Blooming Junction, you'll find beautiful, healthy plants, good, fresh food, and a place to regain peace and calm in your life. We have an unsurpassed collection of unique and distinctive plants and the expertise to help any gardener be successful. And we feature Blooming Advantage plants. Come check out Blooming Junction for an inspiring experience in the garden or in the kitchen. Blooming Junction, offering quality plants for beautiful gardens. Bonsai is a very interesting hobby, and I'm with George from the Division Street Portland Nursery. And George, you are a hobbyist in, in bonsai. Yes. And so you're going to give us some tips maybe for the beginner, somebody that's I'm, been interested in it, and so what do I, what am I getting into? What's, what's it all about? Um, it's mostly about the art form, about mm. the fun of it, the enjoyment of sure. it. You know, it's not the bonsai in an hour thing. It's a, mm. can be a, a few years or a lifelong experience that you enjoy. Right. Um, and just with the right tools, it makes it a lot easier to, yeah. to enjoy. Ah, so maybe we can talk about plants because we all love plants. We're the geeks, so yep. uh, let's start with plants. Plants are, you've got evergreen styles, so the kind that will hold their needles throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Then you also have the deciduous styles over here, like this hornbeam here that will lose its leaves every year. They both have their beauties. Uh, the evergreens will have what's called a timeless beauty. It doesn't change as much, whereas the seasonality of a um, deciduous style will take on you know, the spring colors, possibly flowers, and then the winter structure of the branches. It's really, really cool. That is neat. So you have like all seasons in that one little pot. It's exactly. really cool to see. Yes. And then what about even indoor? Indoor, a um, little more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't provide enough light. That's kind of the initial thing that people think, okay, well, I can do this. I've got enough light. Most people don't. Ah. So I do sometimes steer people to go outside first when they're starting because they'll have more success. Ah. Um, I personally keep my bonsai outside year round. Some wow. people say they'll move them into a cold frame or something like that. But mm -hmm. I personally let them fend for themselves and I just let them stay out there all year long. Yeah, they're outdoor plants. So really they're not going to want to come in Correct. unless maybe for a night if you're having a party. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, you can do that. You know, people say, well, I want to bring it in for, let's say, Christmas. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a living plant or a living Christmas tree. You have to acclimate it in and acclimate it out. So just be very careful with ah, that. As a beginner, then what, what kind of plant should I start with? Um, what I would probably start with is either a juniper, a pine, hornbeam, or maple. Those are the most common ones. So you've got, you know, your junipers are here, mm -hmm. a lot of different styles. You want one that has a structure to it, not one that just necessarily hangs over without any support. Okay. Um, you can go into larches here. The, a lot of people think this is an evergreen, but it's actually a larch will lose its needles in the fall. So it's actually deciduous. 
Um, and another deciduous one we have is the hornbeam again. That It's just a great, great starter plant. And then again, a lot of the maples. Uh, well, and I see this pine up here that looks very mature. So if I got a small pine, would I get that in 20 years? Most likely not, uh -huh. um, if you're going to put it right in the pot and start from there. In most cases, most of your larger bonsais are actually planted out in the yard for a while just so that they can trunk up. Okay, so if I wanted to get something like that, I almost have to start with a bigger plant and then use it as a bonsai train it down the road. Correct, yes. So again, that's the lifelong process. Uh, right, right. And then I see there are some um, tools to have. So let's go over some of the tools that we would need. Okay, there are some basic tools. Uh, the most common would be the um, shear. This is what you're going to use a lot of the time because other than going in and chopping on a huge branch, most of the maintenance that's involved in bonsai is dealing with little branches. Mm -hmm. And so a shear like this is going to be your most used tool. Okay. okay. Then the second most used tool, in my opinion, would be the rake. This rake here, um, it can be used as a rake to rake off the top of the soil. It can be used in the repotting time as a rake to uh, rake the roots down straight so that you can trim them. Um, they, it has a spatula end that you can use as a tamper as well as a depotting, like almost like a shoehorn to get um, okay. trees out of their pots. Oh, okay. Those are the most common ones. Then I do recommend that you get a case for it because if you're like me, who's the mad, uh, mad hatter when it comes to uh, doing my bonsai in the middle of winter or whenever the potting time is, I will use the tools I'll make a big heap of uh, yard debris, let's say, in the kitchen on the paper, <laughs> and then I go and I clean up and I throw everything away, and then I realize two months later that I threw away one of my beautiful tools. Right, they're in the compost pile. Yeah, oh. so by having a case like this, you can actually kind of inventory your tools just to make sure you grabbed everything. Of course, of course. <laughs> and then I see there is special soil. Yes, it's important that you use a bonsai soil or a soil that drains very, very well. Um, don't use just a regular potting soil because it'll hold too much moisture. Okay, and then wire, that's important? Wire is important and there are different gauges of wire. So as an example, this one is a one millimeter and then we can step up to a four millimeter, five millimeter and anything almost in between. The wire is used basically on the tensileness of the branch. So how do you tell what size wire to use? Usually you take your thumb and bend the branch that you're working with here and then you can take the wire end of it and bend oh, that thing and see that if it is the same tensileness because we don't want it that much stronger than the tree itself. Right. And so I can see that this is a little bit more complicated than just like you said a one hour bonsai and so you have a special event happening today at the Division Street um, store. Yes, we are having our customer bonsai show. Our customers bring in their own projects of any sort, any size, any style and technically any quantity. <sighs> and uh, we just have a really fun day with it. Ah, and so there's like a popular vote, so somebody um, wins? Yep, prize? Uh, we'll have prizes, uh, first, second and third prizes as well as lottery prizes and that way anyone has an opportunity to win. Oh. And it's, it's more so for fun than anything. The, and yeah, it's just a great time. It sounds like a great day. And there'll be um, people around to answer your questions. The Bonsai Society will be there. Um, yep. Your staff will be there, you'll be there. Mm -hmm. And so there's gonna be a lot of activity about Bonsai. Uh, you can get your questions answered and just have a good time. Yes. So you know, there's lots of events going on at the Division Street Portland Nursery. So it's Father's Day weekend. So if you have dad and you want to find something to do, it's gonna be a great time. If for any more information, Information, please go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over to their website. At Garland Nursery, you'll find top quality plants, four generations of garden know how, fun and fantastic garden decor, and the best in garden supplies. Come visit us at Garland Nursery. Since 1937, inspiring beautiful and bountiful gardens. The health and beauty of your garden starts from the ground up, and healthy soils begin at Grimm's Fuel. For the best in garden mulch, blended soils, and bark dust, choose Grimm's. You haul delivered or installed, Grimm's can do it. And if you're looking for a new lawn, Grimm's can do that too with our special lawn installation service. Grimm's is also the area's largest recycler of yard debris. The foundation for a healthy garden begins at Grimm's Fuel. 
Over the 30 years that our family has been in the nursery industry, we've learned that anyone can supply a customer with plants and garden supplies. But it's supplying those plants and supplies backed by a knowledgeable staff that can transform a garden and take it from ordinary to extraordinary. That's what we do at Sagawa Nursery. Why be ordinary when you can be extraordinary? Sagawa Nursery, growing beyond the ordinary. So I'm standing here with Steve. Now, Steve, tell me again who you are with and where we're at right now. Right now, William, we are at Tualatin Valley Water District's Water Efficient Demonstration Garden, and today I am representing the Regional Water Providers Consortium. And the reason we're talking to Steve, y'all, is because as gardeners, we really want to use our water well, and you have some great information on how we can start doing that. Yeah, today we want to talk a little bit about what we call smart controllers. Yeah. And smart controllers are basically irrigation controllers that use weather data to adjust the irrigation schedule. So, that's this, now, Controlling water really isn't anything new though, is it? We've been doing this for centuries, no, just in different a, ways. No, it's not a new concept to apply water based on what you know, the, the weather you know, yeah. makes necessary. Um, but our ability to do that uh, efficiently and effectively hasn't always been so great, but there's been some uh, new technology emerging over the last 10 years or so that has really helped make that a lot simpler. So what, uh, I'm assuming some of this technology is yeah, here. Tell yeah, me about it. it's what we call uh, sensor-based uh, irrigation and those sensors can be either on-site sensors like these soil moisture sensor devices or uh, basically a, a simple weather station like this that measure the on-site conditions and basically use that to adjust the irrigation schedule or the other type is uh, called a remote uh, signal type system that actually uses a national network of weather stations yeah, yeah. or a local weather station to get the data and then use that to adjust the schedule. So really all you're doing is basically, if you're using these two, you're gathering information. Now this one I'm, a, I'm assuming goes in the ground, but it's not for really just the general gardener. This is like landscape and stuff this like that right now. This is fairly advanced. You see these type of application more so in a, in a commercial application. Okay. You can do it in a residential, certainly, but it might be a little more sophisticated than the typical homeowner's going to sure. have. But this one is, is, anybody can use this. Yeah, and we're seeing to see a lot, starting to see a lot more of these types of systems go in in the residential market. It's a simple weather station that gets solar radiation, um, rainfall, and temperature, and then uses those to, to come up with, again, a calculation of how much water we need to put back into the landscape. And I'm assuming then that, and you said about an app, there's also, you can have apps now. So this has made a lot right. simpler for everybody because you can do it right from your phone. Yeah, in the last year or so, we've seen a big advance in the technology in that some of these residential platforms are uh, basically, all the adjustment is done from your smart device. Wow. There's no longer any dials or a, a box to go out to in the garage to make your wow. adjustment. Everything is programmed, adjusted. The feedback that you get on your system's operation comes through the smart device, and people seem to love it. And the cost has not, it's, it used to be very prohibitive for a lot of us to do this. For what, a lot of What's folks. happened recently? Well, like a lot of things, you can still spend as much money as you want to on a fancy, sure, sophisticated sure. system. But also in the last couple of years, one of the great things that we're seeing is that the price point has come down to as low as around $150. Wow. So it's really become accessible to everybody now. And then when you couple with that, the rebates that are available to many folks in the area from their water providers, it just becomes a no-brainer. Well, I was going to say, you, that's one of the big things here is you guys are a lot of different places are actually offering those rebates now. So if you buy them, that can even help with your investment into that's using right. water wisely. That's right. It really offsets the initial cost of that investment and then you're just down there uh, capturing the savings and be becoming more efficient. So, and the scheduling and maintenance requirements, and there's, the, the, I wanted to make sure I remembered this. There's some specific things that you can do for information. Tell me about those. Yeah. So. The, the big thing about these controllers is they really rely on specific information about your site. So there are parameters that you enter in the initial programming for um, if you have any watering restrictions. Are there certain days where I don't want to water at all? That's one thing that you can put in there and it will, it will easily meet those requirements. Yeah. You want to put in the type of sprinklers that you have because different sprinklers have different sure. rates of precipitation. And, and when you mix those up, it becomes very difficult to be very uniform. 
you put in the type of soil types you have because different soil types have very different capacities to hold on to water. I like and, that you even have slopes. You can like, you put a slope exactly. on there, which makes a difference. That's another parameter. So if you have a flat landscape, the, your, the way you apply water is gonna be very different than if you have a sloped landscape. Sure. You wanna break up the, into cycles. These controllers have the ability to do that very simply and somewhat automatically depending on how you put in these parameters. Yeah. It takes a lot of the complication away, away from, from the nice. scheduling. You put in the basics and then the controller really does, does the, comp the, work the complicated you. work. Well, you know, it's, it seems like a lot of information. It really is. And as he said, you know, we've been doing this for centuries. This is just technology that will help us do it. And we're always concerned about using our water wisely. So for more information on this great tech, you can go to gardentime.tv and we'll click you over to the websites. You'll get all that information there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Steve. Hi, I'm Burl Mossel with Rare Plant Research. We're a nursery and garden. You're invited to join us the one week in the year that we're open to the public. You can tour our gardens and get inspiration for your own garden. We have 10 greenhouses full of rare and exotic plants. Enjoy lunch from a local caterer while tasting wine at the greenhouses. We will be sampling our wines from Villa Catalana Cellars in the Garden Conservatory Tasting Room. For directions and information, visit us at rareplantresearch.com. Join us and get inspired. Experience more than 120 great beers, ciders, and meads from 60 breweries at the annual Oregon Garden Brewfest. Sip your beer while strolling through 80 acres of gardens, enjoying live music while tasting local foods. The Oregon Garden is less than an hour south of Portland in historic Silverton, and tickets start at just $15. For tickets to the Oregon Garden Brewfest, go to OregonGarden.org. Bring a taste of the old country to your wardrobe and a breath of fresh style with a kilt from Stumptown Kilts. Our easy care kilts are made with fashion and durability in mind. We take pride in our workmanship and attention to detail. We have tons of colors in our versatile style for both men and women, and they're made right here in the Pacific Northwest. We believe we make the best modern kilt available, but we don't make kilts for us, we make them just for you. Stumptown Kilts, the most comfortable and versatile kilt you'll ever own. Judy, yep. do you remember when I asked you if you liked me? I mean, if you really liked me? Yeah, I liked you on Facebook. Yeah, well, I need you to do that again. Well, we really need everyone to like the new Facebook page for Garden Time. So you just go to gardentime.tv and click on the Facebook icon and like us again for our brand new page. Recently, there was this great event at the International Test Garden, the Rose Garden at Washington Park, and everyone had to vote on the best rose that is the day's best rose. And so I'm with Dave Etcheperd. Hey, Dave. Hey, how are you doing today? And so you really have two hats at this event. You are um, one of the sponsors of this event, Dennis 70s. Dennis the 70s sponsors yes. the event, yes. And then what is the other one? That's a really a cool, cool I'm the hat. current president of the Portland Rose Society, which is the oldest in America, second oldest in the world. 27 years this year. And so what happened? There was a lot of people here and we were all voting on something. So what did we vote on? We vote on Portland's best rose and that's the rose today that everybody enjoys the most and just this one day how it looks and the judges just pick it on what they really feel and what they think of that rose. And so what was what was the grand winner today? Uh, Dick Clark was today's winner and it is a fabulous two-toned rose and what I like about Dick Clark is the foliage always looks disease free with very little care or spray. It's so disease resistant. You put it in your garden and with very little care you'll have a stunning rose. Ah, that is nice. And so what are some of the other winners? Some of the other winners were um, Fiji, which won the best hybrid tea, mm -hmm. and uh, Francis Malone won the most fragrance. Oh, it was beautiful. Everyone loves fragrance in their roses. Peachy King was the best shrub rose, and Fired Up, the best Floribunda. Rock and Roll was the people's choice. Ah. So on Saturday, anybody can come and vote. And the Saturday, right after the parade, you can come up to the International Test Garden and vote on your favorite rose. Anyone can do it. And this year, they picked the most fragrant and people's choice 
was rock and roll. So uh -huh. they picked the same one for both, uh -huh. rock and roll. And it's so nice that the community can get involved too. So you have to put that on your calendar for next year, right after the, the Grand Floral Parade, to come up to the Rose Garden and vote. And so tell us a little bit about the Portland Rose Society because it's a wonderful, wonderful group and how do we get involved with that? So the Portland Rose Society is here to promote roses in the city of uh, Roses, Portland, Oregon. And uh, you can join, it's, it's, uh, it's for families and uh, for $15 you can have your family, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole family join for a year. Wow. And so you can contact the Rose Society, uh, you can go to our website and, um, and join or you can always stop at Dennis's 7Ds and look us up and we will, uh, we will make sure you not only get a gorgeous rose but have you join the Rose Society. And it is a great group of people, you know, they learn about roses, they talk about roses, they visit everyone's gardens to look at roses, it's like, it's all about roses. Yeah, and around town we have events where we will sharpen your pruning shears for free <laughs> and uh, teach you how to prune roses oh. and, and how to grow roses. Uh, we have a great rose fertilizer, a 151010, that to me is the best fertilizer there is. It has micronutrients in it, and if you want to grow good roses, the Portland Rose Society fertilizer is fabulous. Ah, that is so great tips about it because I think everyone in Portland, Portland area, all the state of Oregon should have roses in their garden. Yes, of course, and they do so good here. They just flourish, and a day like this here is uh, is good for it's roses. Perfect. But even the rain, rain's not that bad. No, it's true, and that's why you come out to the International Rose Test Garden at Washington Park to see the best roses that you love for your own garden and you could really look at it and look at it as a whole test mm -hmm. and pick the ones that you want the best. Yes and Harry Landers the curator of this international test garden likes to keep the roses that you can go out and purchase somewhere around town so most all of the roses that you see here you pick a variety that you like and then you can take that rose plant it in your garden. Right and so if you want to do that too you have to go to Dennis 7Ds they have several locations in and around Portland area and at the coast and you can get some roses there talk to your staff and learn more about that mm -hmm. and really have have a little test garden in your own backyard. Yes and Dennis 7Ds is known for roses on the west coast I like to say Portland but ah, it goes beyond that. Definitely. We do uh, uh, over 400 varieties and we do wow. just the quality rose and and Dave Snodgrass, the owner, supports all kinds of rose events, but he really puts a lot into uh, Portland's best rose. Yeah, that is true. So really, you have it here. You have to come down to the garden and enjoy it. It's one of our beautiful parks here. And next year, put on your calendar to come and vote for Portland's best rose. Thanks, Dave, for all you do. Thank, Thank you. you. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Do you want to be green? Do the easy stuff first. Hi, I'm Sarah from Portland Nursery. The U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee says for every dollar spent on a shade tree, you can save $5 on cooling, blocking the penetrating heat in the summer and allowing the warm rays through in the winter. Dollar for dollar, there's no better energy and money saver than a good, deciduous shade tree. Portland Nursery's professionals can help you make the perfect selection. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. DRAM is celebrating 75 years of design and manufacturing of quality watering tools. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. At Euro American, we partner with phenomenal breeding companies like Suntory Flowers in order to source plant material at all gardening levels. We then reach out to retail centers like Bauman's in order to provide that material to you. One of our favorites is the new compact lofos. The lofos have beautiful tubular flowers that bloom all summer long in hanging baskets or in containers. It's low maintenance and self-cleaning. Find this and other new introductions at Bauman's Farm and Garden. Spring is here, and now is the time to bring spectacular colors and fragrance to your garden. Farmington Gardens can help you succeed in any corner of your garden. From hanging baskets, container gardens, veggie starts, water features, or something truly unique from our gift shop, Farmington Gardens brings colors to life. Open every day, just a short drive out Farmington Road. Farmington Gardens, we're growing for you. 
Join us for Berry's Brews and Barbecue, now happening three weekends in June, featuring Oregon Craft Ciders and Brews and Barbecue. Enjoy barbecue. You pick strawberries, hay rides, live music, and much, much more. It's farm fun for the whole family at French Prairie Gardens. So I'm standing here with Nancy Bewley, and we are at J. Frank Schmidt and Son. And these, these amazing people are tree growers, and not just for us, but really for all over the world. And so we wanted to discuss with you guys a, a word that you use called utilitrees, because almost every city has to deal with this concept. First of all, tell me what that means. Well, utilitrees is a word that we coined probably about 15 years ago to develop a, a line of trees to identify trees that are suitable for planting underneath utility lines. Okay, which a lot of cities have the power lines mm -hmm. and utility lines mm -hmm. right over the area mm -hmm. where these would be. Mm -hmm. They can either be, they might be power lines or telephone cables, but mostly power lines. It's really important yeah. to not, it's always a conflict when you plant bigger trees under power lines because of electrocution issues and sure. power outages. And so it's really, important to choose trees that don't get too big. So, and, and Nancy, I know that all of us have seen this at some time. We'll be driving somewhere and you'll see a, even a conifer and it'll be this. They'll be split down the middle uh -huh. or one half. Mm -hmm. That's what they've had to do to cut that away from power lines. Right. But these yeah. trees that you've mm -hmm. selected won't be, that won't be a problem. No, they're, they're specifically selected to be generally 25 feet or shorter at maturity. Nice. And we're actually standing under one. Mm -hmm. Tell me about this mm -hmm. beauty and why it's so special. Well, this is a Zelkova and it's special because it's a really small Zelkova. Yeah, because they're not normally. Yeah, they <laughs> might go, a, a Zelkova might go 40 or 50, 60 feet even at maturity. And the shade trees that you see in the uh, out on the streets are generally quite upright and, and tall yeah. and they're, they might be 40 or 50 feet. Well, this one is one that we found in our fields that was just a, a little little Sprite. So we named it City Sprite nice. Zelkova. <laughs> and it's just, it's a miniature. Um, it's it's vigorous, it's, it's a you know, fairly fast grower, but it's very compact. You can yeah. see that the leaves are very short internodes, we call them. So it's just compact in all ways. And such beautiful color of the leaves too. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a nice, wonderful green color mm -hmm. and shape even on top. Yeah, it's just a really sweet tree. And one of the parameters of a utility tree is that it needs to have nice like 45 degree upright branching right. so that it can be pruned up for clearance for, you know, for you and I to walk underneath sure, and sure. for cars to go by. So you have to think of both the top mm -hmm. and the walk through mm -hmm. underneath at right. the same time. Yeah. yeah. Now there's another one right over here that we're going to look at real quick. Tell me about this one and mm. what's the name of it and what makes it so well, special? Well this tree is, um, it's a tilia which is a linden and it looks like a linden only everything about it is smaller. The, Again uh, a yeah. big tree normally. Right, right. So it's a dwarf and um, it has the flowers that lindens have, and uh, but you'll notice that it just ha again it has really short inner nodes, it does. Um, yeah. real close between the leaves, and the leaves are just cute little they're, things. They're, they're little crinkly, adorable things. It's true. <laughs> and it is um, we named it summer sprite, and we've grown this for quite a few years. One yeah. of our customers in New Jersey found it and sent us the the budwood and and so we started propagating it and named it so it's just a great little tree so now we've got a couple more to talk about mm -hmm. but they're over here so let's take okay. a walk okay. over and we'll look at those so now nancy what seems to be directly behind you and i it kind of looks like a cherry but it's really beautiful well that's because it is a really unusual cherry and probably the best one that you could plant in the northwest wow. it just has the most clean dark green beautiful foliage that even if it didn't flower it'd be a beautiful tree and it, it almost looks tropical the, the leaves are so beautiful it um it does have kind of a super dark color <laughs> all summer and the fall color is just remarkable nice, nice. Yeah. and then right over here there is one right behind me tell me about that one because that one delights me <laughs> <laughs> okay this is a new uh, Acer Grissium, which is paperbark maple, which we just introduced this year, and it is called Fireburst. Nice. We named it Fireburst because it just, in the fall, it goes boom. Yeah. And um, it's one of the um, 
staples of our utilities line is the is the Acer Grissium, the paper bark maple, and uh, real good tree for using under the wires. It's compact and has all season color. Nice. It just has great dark, small foliage. The leaves aren't too much work to regular up in yeah. the fall. And good heat and drought tolerance and good so form. We have one bark. more that we're gonna actually go mm -hmm. to, but before we do that, tell me real quickly about one that I know you are just delighted about. What's this one? Well, it's so new, I kind of hate to talk about it. But again, <laughs> it's another Sprite. Uh, sparkling Sprite is a little crab apple that we just introduced. And I, you're not going to find it in the marketplace yet. Yeah. You know, in the next, because I mean, next, this is kind of like your hot tip. Yeah. There's the yeah, new right. ones coming on. <laughs> but it's just a remarkable little crab apple with really, really good foliage quality. You know, the flowers on crab apples, pretty much, they always have pretty flowers. Yeah. These are extra nice, but it's really important when you choose a crab apple to choose one that is has good foliage quality and good fall color and good form so that you have something that's really enjoyable all year long. Well, that's true. Now, we're going to take a quick run over to one last tree of Styrex and look at that. Let's okay. go over there. Thank you. So now tell me about this beauty. Well, this is a snowbell and it's well named. It, it rings in spring, I yeah. like to say. Yeah. It blooms in the late spring. And it is a, this one is a particularly upright snowbell. Yeah. Most snowbells, you know, the, the species is very rounded. So we selected this for its upright, narrow form. You can see that the branches are quite upright. And so it's one that can be raised up as a street tree nice. and compact form. And you actually made a website to help people get information about about utilities. Right. We have a fairly long, extensive list and it's a list that we made for our national audience. So it isn't a tree don't, you know, locally we wouldn't want to pick out just any tree and say it would be appropriate for your garden. But what we do is it's at utilities.com and there's a description of all the trees and then if you work with your local garden center they can help you pick out trees that are just truly appropriate for our climate zone. Perfect and if you've ever had to deal with the city on putting the wrong tree in that space you'll know that you want to get it right the first time so we invite you to go to gardentime.tv we'll click you over to their website and you can get all that information plant the perfect tree for the strip that you require in your own home. Thank you so much Nancy. All right thank you William. So Judy, yes. one time I had a ground cover, it got this tall. <laughs> Are you telling me a fish story? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of fish stories, we want to say happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. And you know, we're out at Garland's and they have a lovely selection of plants and flowers. So maybe take dad out to Garland's or to an independent garden center and pick up a pollinator plant for your garden. If you have any more questions about today's show or if you would like to re-watch the entire episode, you can always go to gardentime.tv. William and I thank you for watching and we'll see you next week here in Garden Time. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day! Day. Hi, I'm Burl Mossel with Rare Plant Research. We're a nursery and garden. You're invited to join us the one week in the year that we're open to the public. You can tour our gardens and get inspiration for your own garden. We have 10 greenhouses full of rare and exotic plants. Enjoy lunch from a local caterer while tasting wine at the greenhouses. We will be sampling our wines from Villa Catalana Cellars in the Garden Conservatory Tasting Room. For directions and information, visit us at rareplantresearch.com. Join us and get inspired. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.